Hi. First of all, to introduce myself, I'm Lynn Wilson. Uh, I'm the Operation Manager of the National Association of Disability Practitioners and also a disability pro professional myself in my own time. I've conducted research into the disabled student experience over the last six or seven years, and I'm currently leading the research, the NADP Research Committee are conducting on the well-being of disabled disability professionals in further and higher education. However, this presentation is a little different and concerns a topic that I'm really passionate about. The differences in disability language that we're encountering on a daily basis now that we access materials from across the world. This week we had a fabulous webinar presentation on study abroad for disabled students from Valerie and Dominique, who are our link partners from Belgium. But we got some questions about the variation in language across the world. Do we say students with disabilities or do we say disabled students? We refer this to person first versus identity first language. After the NADP International Conference in 2018, I wrote a paper on these differences together with Professor Nicola Martin, who's another of our directors. This is published in our Journal of Inclusive Practice in Further and Higher Education, and it forms the basis of this presentation. All the references that I mention in this presentation are listed in that article, which you can access uh, free of charge on the NADP website. What I'm aiming to do is give an overview of how models of disability relate to variations in disability language across the world. These variations have come about during years of activism to ensure that disabled people can live fully included lives in society. Proponents of the various forms of language to describe disability are vociferous in defending their particular positions. They're certainly not united in their views. The idea of this presentation is to stimulate discussion about the language we use around disability and the meanings we convey when we use it. What does this convey to the students we're talking to? So what are models of disability? They're ideas or concepts that help people understand the idea of disability and they shape people's perceptions, sometimes positively and sometimes negatively. So SMART gave an illustration of the benefits and concerns associated with disability models. So they provide a definition for disability. They provide explanations about causal attribution and responsibility attribution, as in where we attribute cause, where we attribute responsibility. They're based on needs, but these are perceived needs by external people normally, not the disabled people themselves. They guide the formulation and implementation of policy. And they are certainly not value neutral. They determine which academic disciplines study and learn about disabled people. They shape the identity of PWDs, as it says here, which is um, persons with disabilities, which is uh, one of the models we'll talk about in a bit, and they can cause prejudice and discrimination. Okay, so if we look first of all at moral and religious models of disability, Henderson and Bryan offer a thorough explanation of the moral and religious models of disability, which are associated with a number of religions. Primarily from a moral or religious model, disability is seen as a punishment from God for particular sins. These perceived sins could have been committed by the person or their parents or even their ancestors. It can also be seen as a test of faith. And you see words associated with it, such as cursed, blamed, possessed. This model is not often seen in the UK as a mainstream model, but it's still found in some theological circles. However, as disability professionals, we may come across it in disability support when we work with international students. As some come from cultures which this form of thinking still endures, 
it can make it difficult for them to contact disability services and express their needs. One advisor described her challenges talking with a student who talked in terms of not needing adjustments as they were praying away their impairment. Okay, a second model is the medical model of disability. So Olkin describes medical models, and there is more than one, as disability is seen as a medical problem that resides in the individual. It's a defect or failure of a bodily system. And as such, it is inherently abnormal and patholog pathological. The goals of intervention are cure, amelioration of the physical condition to the greatest extent possible, and rehabilitation. So this re tends to reinforce the difference between disabled and non-disabled people and essentially disregards the impact of environmental factors. It looks at what's wrong with the person. It can't be ignored that it confers a power differential between the medical profession professional who has to, the power to define an impairment or difference as abnormal and then issue or withhold a diagnosis, which may be the passport to support. It's a very prevalent model in the UK with a provision of evidence needed to obtain disabled students allowances and or reasonable adjustments. And disability professionals may be regarded as gatekeepers to reasonable adjustments. And this can also be seen as a barrier between disabled students and the people who are there to help them. OK, moving on, social model of disability. Now, this was developed in reaction to the limitations of the medical model and was very much inspired by the activism of the British disability movement in the 1960s and 1970s. Using this model, disability is regarded as a socially constructed phenomenon which disables people with impairments and therefore any meaningful solution must be directed at societal change rather than individual adjustment and rehabilitation. So impairment, well, that refers to in-person characteristics like cerebral palsy or hearing impairment. Disabilities are formed of barriers to the inclusion of disabled people. Structural barriers like stairs are obvious, but attitudinal barriers such as the attitude that nursing is in an inappropriate uh, career for someone with dyscalculia can be a lot more subtle. This model is not without its critics, though, as some disabled people claim that they're not just disabled by their environment, but they are also people with impairments that can't be ignored. Many UK higher education institutions claim to operate under a social model banner, although the insistence on the production of medical evidence to access reasonable adjustments suggests aspects of a medical model approach are still there. And the fourth model I'll talk about, although there are many others if you go into the, the literature on it, is the affirmative or identity model of disability. The term affirmative emphasises ordinariness and rejects impairment as tragedy. It's been accredited with inspiring disabled people to adopt a positive self-image that celebrates disability pride. It's closely related to the social model. They both share the understanding that the experience of disability is socially constructed, but the affirmative model incorporates a sensitivity to individual experience, which can include intersectionality as well. Many of us find our undergraduate students are learning about their own identities as they become more independent. People tend to prefer to choose their own labels these often change over time and circumstance. A disability practitioner shared an example of a student who variously described herself as a deaf student. Someone who's deaf, a hearing impaired student, or a student with a small hearing problem, depending on circumstances. But she was always a psychology student. So, OK. Do we talk about disabled student or student with disability? 
when we look at the two types of main two types of language we've got identity first language which says disabled student referring to disabled people or disabled student is termed identity first language in which the identity is placed before the person acknowledging that it's a key part of someone's experience it does not imply that their disability is their complete identity but rather that rather that it is entwined with their identity. Person first language would use student with disabilities. And many theorists from the USA argue for person first language, aiming to focus on the person rather than the disability. And so you will see the term person with disabilities appearing in many publications from the USA and across Europe. UK social modelists argue that the term people with disabilities suggests that individuals have a disability rather than being disabled by their environment. And there's even a growing movement for identity first language in the States. This is being led by groups who believe it's not possible to separate themselves from their condition as it's part of their identity. Some autistic people, for example, believe that they form a cultural minority and take pride in their identity, and deaf culture is similarly expressed. In contrast, some highly oppressed groups, such as those people with learning difficulties, prefer person-first language as they feel that this implies that with the cor correct environment, they can be separated from their impairment and it will no longer affect them. We have confusion in the UK, though. Uh, it varies across our contexts. In universities, we refer to disabled students. In schools, disabled children are have, described as having special educational needs and disabilities, SEND. And colleges vary between the two terms, depending on what you're studying with them. As disability advisors, we are well aware of students' confusion as they navigate the move between school and university terminology. And this is a concern, but is it a wider concern? Nikki Martin in 2008 cited the example of a Russell Group undergraduate with five A-levels, all at grade A, saying, I used to be a special needs child in the context of a DSA needs assessment. He further demonstrated low self-esteem during the in interaction and reported not having been particularly encouraged towards university. This othering language can have a lasting effect on disabled students and has been shown to precipitate social exclusion and lower self-perception. Disabled people are progressively rejecting the imposed identity of other with many neurodiverse people arguing that their differences are not an impairment, but part of the normal human diversity. OK, so what can we do as disability and inclusivity professionals? As you look at the material published by your institution or company, keep reading it with a critical eye. Don't just accept what it says. Not all universities are using the right language, for instance. A lot of them are influenced by different cultures and swap between languages all over the place. Look for medical model language. Look for othering and challenge it when you find it. Ableism, racism, sexism and classism all promote stereotypes which are manifested in negative attitudes that lead to prejudice. The continuing use of medical model language perpetrates these negative stereotypes. Disabled students may well have heard these detrimental ideas throughout their lives, from diagnosis to special education. Internalized oppression can be the result and can directly affect the way they perceive themselves. Disability professionals in their various roles have an important part to play in encouraging students to see the positive aspects of their identity as disabled or neurodiverse individuals. Much of this can be achieved with the use of positive language. Disability professionals working individually with disabled students can assist students to challenge these ideas and labels by indicating the positive aspects of their identity. 
with terminology specific learning differences may be much more palatable to some than specific learning difficulties or specific learning disabilities. Language matters and it's important to understand the perspective of the student. The language we use to refer to impairment, neurodiversity, medical conditions and disability all has its roots in the idea of models of disability. These have changed over time and context and continue to evolve. Something that's affecting me at the moment is reading about neurodiversity. But it was pointed out to me that we're all neurodiverse. We are all different in the ways we think and react to things. When we talk about autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, Tourette's, etc., we are actually talking about neurodivergence. This is still quite new to me, and I'm still avidly reading about these new ideas and working out my own position. But Judy Singer's new thoughts are a good starting point if you have a look at her blog. Judy is the Australian psychologist who is generally considered to have derived the concept of neurodiversity. So our ideas are still evolving and changing. What does this mean for the students we support? Well, my key takeaway from all the research I did for this paper still concludes that we need a student-centred approach. No surprises there then. Nikki and I recommended in the article that disability diversity and inclusivity professionals are guided by the individual preferences of our disabled students. It's also important to recognise that just as we change our ideas over time, so do our students. They are at a point in their lives where they're learning at a rapid rate and that affects not only their academic courses but also their ideas about themselves as they grow into independence. We need to adapt our language to reflect their preferences for terminology, which may change dramatically over the years that we know them. And finally, keep thinking, keep reading, keep refining your own point of view and keep challenging. Thank you for listening.